Well, joining me now is our defence and security analyst, Professor Michael Clark. Michael, great to see you as ever. Uh, let's begin with uh, that USS warship there in the Red Sea. First of all, I mean, questions first of all about uh, why Yemen would be getting involved, mm. who could be behind uh, those missiles coming from Yemen, and then, of course, how incredible that that US ship was in the right place at the right time. Yeah, uh, the USS Kearney. It's a destroyer, uh, an Arleigh Burke-class destroyer, uh, which is an anti-aircraft destroyer. Uh, it's quite an old ship, actually, almost 30 years old, not very big, destroyers are quite small. But actually, um, it's what's on it that matters. It's the, it's the radars, the sensors, and all of the missiles. And so the ship itself, I mean, you know, the hull is just a biscuit tin. It's what you put in the biscuit tin that matters, and it's got some very sophisticated stuff in there. And it did really well, because if we look at where it was uh, in the Red Sea, as you said, it was in exactly the right place, at exactly the right time. It came through the Suez Canal almost 48 hours ago now, on the 18th, and last night it was round about here, um, about halfway down the, uh, the Red Sea itself. The, the missiles, which almost certainly, to answer your earlier question, was launched by the Houthis in Yemen, and the missile track seems to have been going straight over the area where the ship was, and that's the area of interception, the one that's sort of shaded in, in red. So somewhere in that area they intercepted these three cruise missiles and uh, a group of drones. Technologically, that's no contest. That ship was easily able to cope with it. But it just shows what one modern ship can do. And here are the Americans now defending Israeli airspace for them. Mm. Luck or, or intelligence, do you think that it was? No, uh, it was good, good planning. Mm. And this is not the only US ship uh, in the Red Sea. The US is bringing more ships into the Red Sea. So the, the USS Bataan, which is a helicopter carrier packed with Marines, that's entering the Red Sea. Uh, the, uh, the, the hull, uh, the, is it not the Cordell hull, the, uh, the Carter hull, the Carter Hall, that's a landing ship, that's going into the Red Sea. The Mesa Verde that was in Britain just a couple of weeks ago, that's going into the Red Sea. So the Americans have got two carrier battle groups arriving in the eastern Mediterranean off Israel, and they've got these, these powerful ships moving into the Red Sea. A big concentration of naval power, which gives them aircraft, missiles and quite a lot of marines who could do all sorts of useful things if they think they need to. Well, that's it, isn't it? If they think they need to. And if we think about uh, Yemen, if it is the Iran-backed Houthis who are firing uh, missiles uh, towards Israel, we've also seen attacks uh, earlier in the week on US bases in Iraq and Syria. What yeah. sort of a picture are you building up of what that Yeah, is? well, I mean, it seems now, because of the tensions that this crisis is creating, is that it's open season now on United States personnel uh, and, indeed, US US citizens. And last night there were attacks on the, uh, the Al-Assad Air Base uh, uh, itself and in the Al-Tanf. I mean, the Al-Assad Air Base in Iraq and the Al-Tanf garrison, which is right on the border between Iraq and Syria, it's actually in Syrian territory as it happens, that was attacked as well. No deaths but some injuries. And this shows, I think these are free enterprise groups who are seeing American bases and just lobbing drones and missiles and whatever they've got at them. I think we'll see more of this because the question is, is Iran restraining all of its proxies in the region? And is it in particular interested in doing something more in Lebanon, South Lebanon on the Lebanon-Israeli border? That's the bit that really worries me. Yeah, and of course, if uh, Iran, uh, which, as you say, financially backs the Houthis in Yemen, uh, Hezbollah in yeah. uh, Lebanon, and Hamas, of course, in Gaza, if it decides that the US is essentially Israel now because the US has put itself yeah. behind uh, Israel. Where might that lead? They may, and they may not be able to stay out even if they want to. The, the, their best judgment may be that we ought to stay out of this, but they may not be able to because of the amount of free enterprise that may be going on in the area. And we now know there are all sorts of groups who are moving from Syria and Iraq towards southern Lebanon. They're moving into that area. And in the area of southern Lebanon, on the border between Lebanon and Israel, it's become almost a depopulated area. A lot of the, uh, the Lebanese villagers have emptied people just got out of the way, and the, the Israelis have, have, have emptied their settlements, they've just br brought people out. So this whole area now, uh, on the border, is, is almost like a, a battlefield waiting to happen. Now, I hope that doesn't happen, but a lot of civilians have just got out of the way on the assumption that they expect fighting to start there soon. And it's right on the Golan Heights, which Israel took from Syria in 1967. It is not, I'm not predicting this, but it's not beyond the bounds of possibility. If Israel gets very heavily committed here and finds that it's not doing very well, President Assad of Syria would love to be a bit more popular with the Syrian population he's made war on for the last 10 years or more. He might be tempted to try and take the Golan Heights back. That's a, a very worrying situation, as, as you put it there. I don't predict it. I simply say let's keep it in mind as yeah. we look at how this crisis develops. Yeah, a tinderbox, as you say, uh, potentially. Uh, Michael, thanks very much. Michael Clark there.